Well, good morning, happy Sunday, and welcome home to Pleasant Valley Church. My name is Terry, and I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us here this morning. If this is one of your first times with us, an extra special welcome to you. We are so glad that you are here. I'd love to connect with you and see if there's any way that we as a church can love and serve you. Simply give me a call or send me an email. In return, I would love to send you this free book called Hope in the Dark. Two things are really true about Pleasant Valley Church. We love God and we love people. Speaking about loving God, in a few moments we're going to have an opportunity to worship God through our voices. We'll be worshiping through singing. Another way that we can worship God is through our finances. We can worship God through giving, through giving back to him a portion of the income of the salary that he's allowed us to earn this week. There's a number of different ways that that can take place. You can text to give, text 84321 and follow the link. You can give online or you can arrange for a porch drop off or pick up. Whatever way you're most comfortable with is fine with us. We love God. Not only do we love God, but we love people. Last night, we had our Blue Christmas gathering online. And if you couldn't make it and would still like an ornament, just let me know. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we will be showing a 45-minute video called Surviving the Holidays. It's from our friends at Grief Share through Zoom. Um, so if you're invited to be a part of that, and if you're mourning, as I am, the passing of someone that you love, join me and watch this helpful video. There's also a book called Surviving the Holidays, and they're available too for $10 each. As a church, we are receiving Christmas cards for the church family until tomorrow, Monday, at 6 p.m. Then the cards will be delivered on Tuesday and Wednesday with our Christmas Eve kits. Christmas Eve kits? What is that, Pastor Terry? Well, this year, we will be worshiping Jesus and celebrating online. And we're making our Christmas Eve service live through YouTube. It won't be on the online church platform, but simply follow the link off our church website, the Christmas Eve link off our church website, one click, and then you'll be able to join us. We'll be able to chat online and uh, and it'll be a live stream of our service and everyone in our church directory will be getting a kit if you're not sure if you are in our directory and would like to get a kit and it's free just contact me at the church office before monday at six and we will personally deliver one to you it's filled with song sheets candles and other items of goodness that will enhance your worship on christmas eve in January, we will be launching two new online life groups. One on the Book of Judges, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and one on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Jump on the PleasantValleyChurch.com website and follow the links to learn more. Next Sunday, we will be celebrating communion together and hearing stories of what you learned about God or from God in 2020. Hope you can join us for that. Hope you can join us too for our Zoom connection time right after the service this morning. Well, let's pray and then I'll invite Ralph and Sonia to light our Advent candle. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, good morning. Thanks for a brand new day, a brand new day to be loved by you and a brand new day for us to love you back. Lord, that's our heart's desire this morning. Meet with us as we meet with you. Change us. Make us more like Jesus. We love you. We need you. And we give this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ralph and Sonia. Few would have considered it a silent night, a holy night. Travelers jostled in the city gates. Weary fists pounded on closed doors, pleading on the outside, arguing from within, all to the same refrain, no room. Among the houses rang raucous Roman laughter, census takers with comfortable quarters, and plenty of food and wine. There is little peace and less goodwill between stranger and villager here. Somewhere a dog barked, 
a lamb bleated, a woman moaned, and a baby cried. Out on the hillsides, exposed to the cold night, without even a stable for warmth, shepherds huddled around the fire, guarding their flocks against thieves and wolves. Suddenly, a light to split the darkness, a voice, a song, a chorus of angels. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a child, a son, a shepherd, a king, a savior which is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Awaken, O little town that cannot sleep. Hear the shepherd's words. The angel's message. And arise to a sound unfamiliar. The triumph of joy. The third pink candle is a candle of joy, symbolizing the song this angel sang, a message of joy. Luke 2, 7 to 15. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Good morning, Pleasant Valley. Merry Christmas. We're so glad you're here with us, and we are excited to join in worship with you on this last Sunday before Christmas. Would you join us as we sing, O Come All Ye Faithful?
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, it's so amazing to, to think that the creator of this universe invites us to talk with him, to talk with him in prayer, to talk with him about everything that matters to us. Now, we don't just want to ask God for stuff, as important as it is, and, and we'll be doing that in a few moments, but we also want to add in other features of prayer, of our conversation with God. We want to acknowledge who God is, and we'll do that in just a moment through our adoration time. And then we want, once we see God's holiness, we see our sinfulness. And if you haven't done it yet this week, let this time be a time where you can privately confess your sins to God. And then we'll enter into a time of thanksgiving where we can thank God for all that he is and all that he's done for us. And then we'll enter into a time of supplication. Supplication is a fancy word for request. God wants us to, to give him all of our cares and concerns because he cares for us. So would you join with me and let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for this day and for this opportunity that you have invited us to, to talk with you. Lord, we want to begin our conversation by acknowledging who you are. God, you are holy. You are kind. You are good. Father, here are other prayers of adoration to you. Father, as we see your holiness, as we see your perfectness, it causes us to see our sinfulness. And Lord, through this past week, there have been thoughts or actions or words that have not pleased you, that are sinful, that are rebellion against you. Lord, hear us now as we, as we bring these items to you, asking for your forgiveness. Hear us as we confess. Lord, your word promises us that as we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning, we just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for the many items that we have to be thankful for. Lord, hear us as we offer our prayers of thanksgiving to you. Lord, thank you for inviting us to talk with you about everything that matters to us. So, Lord, now we come and, and we make requests of you. Lord, these are, are things that we simply can't solve on our own, where we need your help, your intervention. And so, Lord, we pray for different people. We pray for different needs within our church family. Lord, we pray and ask that you would answer these prayers in the best way. Hear us as we pray. Lord, within our church family, there are many health needs this morning. Father, we especially pray for, uh, for Amalia's sister-in-law, Kim, as she's in the hospital. Lord, we pray for an ongoing recovery in her life and body so that she will experience you as her healer, as her forgiver, as her savior. Lord, there are many other health needs in and through our church family. And we ask for your grace to be upon each person, upon each caregiver as well. Lord, there are financial needs in addition to the health needs. There are 
relational needs. Lord, there are lives that are in conflict. Lord, you know each need. And in this time of great need, we ask for your great help. Lord, we pray for other churches in Brantford and around the world, Lord, that are that are going through similar challenges with this pandemic that we are. Lord, we ask for you to bless them so that they can be a blessing to all those that they learn, that they love and serve. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time that we can be together with each other and together with you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. A few weeks ago, we began this new sermon series called Christmas in the Dark. Two weeks ago, Mike shared with us all about hope. Last week, we looked at peace, the peace that God brings. This morning, we're going to be talking about joy and how we can turn our oi into joy this Christmas. First, let's begin by defining joy, especially in relationship to happiness. The two are similar, and yet they're significantly different. Happiness is what happens to you. Um, it's about circumstances. You find a toonie. You get a free coffee and you're happy. Happiness is what happens to you. It could be about the weather. The sun is shining and you're happy. It's all about cause and effect. It comes and it goes uh, because something breaks or something is stolen or the car breaks down and then all of a sudden we're no longer happy. Happiness is a moving target. Write this down. Today's happiness is tomorrow's complaint. Is that true? What makes us happy today will make us complain tomorrow. And if you don't believe me, just think back to this summer. Do you remember how hot and dry and sunny this summer was? And we began by going, wow, this is so great. Until it was day after day after day and then crops weren't growing and the, the weather was having a negative impact. On us. You know, our best clue to the meaning of happiness is found in one of its close synonyms, the word contentment, which has the same root word as the same root as the word contain. To be content is to contain or possess what we want. So to be happy is to be satisfied either because we have what we desire or because we've given up on our desire to get what we don't have. Happiness is defined by facts. You know, our stocks are going up in value, so we're happy. Happiness is defined by facts. Our grades are good, and so we're happy. Um, money can buy you happiness, but it can't sustain that happiness. Really, happiness is skin deep, and there's nothing wrong with being happy, but there's something greater, there's something deeper, there's something richer, and that's what joy is all about. Happiness is what happens to you. As we talk about joy, joy is something produced in you. One of the things as followers that we get at the moment of salvation is joy. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. And the standard for joy never changes. When we ask ourselves, what will honor God? That's a better question than what will make me happy. Because God is the source of our joy. Joy is based on truth. It's, 
it's soul deep, not skin deep like happiness is, because you can be joyful even when things are not good around you. Um, here's an example of that. You can be really joyful and really sad at the same time. If you've ever attended a funeral of a Christian, we're really sad. We really miss that person, but we're really joyful because we know we're going to see them again one day in heaven. Joy is something produced in you. Joy doesn't depend on our acquisition of something, but rather on our encounter with something. More specifically, with someone, that person being Jesus. Happiness possesses, joy appreciates. Happiness grasps, joy beholds. Joy Joy comes from knowing that Jesus is in control. Can I say that again? Joy comes from knowing that Jesus is in control. Joy comes from trusting that Jesus is in control. That because you and I, as followers of God, are connected to God, that at the end, everything will be okay, and I don't need to worry, which is why I can have joy today. It's not in my circumstances, but it's in my Savior. It's not in my present, but in God's promise. Joy ultimately comes from trusting that Jesus is in control. But since we're being honest this morning, there are things that don't bring us happiness and delight this Christmas. There's a lot of oys. And you felt them, and I felt them, and the world is feeling them. But, you know, we're not the first. And it was tr as it's true of us today, it's also true of folks thousands of years ago. If you have your Bibles with you, can I invite you to open them up or turn them on to Psalm 126. We're going to be looking at another psalm this week as we did last week. Here's the context of this psalm. The, the Jewish people were in their promised land, but they rebelled against God and became disobedient. And as a consequence for that disobedience, an invading army took them over and took many people captive. About 70 years later, they were released from that captivity, and they were back in their home and native land. But... But their joy began to subside when they saw the hard work of rebuilding that was ahead of them. So as we look at this psalm, you'll see two different kinds of joy. In verses 1 through 3, you'll see easy joy. That's the, the high five and the yee-haw and the yay, God is so good kind of joy. That's the, that's the easy joy. But then as we progress through this psalm from verses 4 to 6, you'll see not an easy joy, but a hard joy. And I think before verse 4 comes, it's almost as if the author of this psalm takes a deep breath, lets a little bit of a sigh out, because there's a painful acceptance, and yet at the same time there's a deep faith. Remember, joy comes from trusting that God is in control. So follow along with me. Verse 1 of Psalm 126. The writer begins, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Sometimes joy is easy. It's fun. It's yeehaw and high five and it's it's great. God is so good. But then, then sometimes there is hard joy where there's a painful acceptance of our present reality and yet there's a deep faith in our God and in our future. 
hard faith, hard joy begins in verse 4. The writer writes, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Well, what does that mean, streams in the Negev? Streams in the Negev, the Negev was a, a desert area. But when the rains came, that land flourished. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Lion King, you know that um, towards the end of the movie, everything is, is wrong and there's a big battle. The hyenas have taken over the Lion King world, but then the rains come. And then there's a re-flourishing that takes place here. Here the author is saying, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those, those rains that bring healing and restoration to the land. Verse 5. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaths with him. Weeping, carrying, she carrying seed to sow, sowing in tears. There's a, there's a painful struggle going on here. And yet there is a future hope knowing that Jesus is in control. Maybe that's you this morning, where life is not as you intended it to be. Life is not as you want it to be. Know this, know this, that God's ability to restore life is beyond our understanding. That forests sometimes burn down and are able to grow back, Broken bones heal. Even grief is not a permanent condition. But our tears, our tears can sow seeds that will grow into a harvest of joy. Because God is able to bring good out of tragedy. When burdened by sorrow, know that your times of grief will end. And that you will again find joy. But we must be patient as we wait. God's great harvest of joy is coming. That's why Paul writes in Galatians 6, 9, he writes and says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. There are so many things, so many things today that try to jam up our joy that really that try to make us question our faith in God but we can counter we can counter those those things that crop up and try to jam our joy we can turn our oi to joy here's four ways that we can begin to do that number one in turning oi to joy number one accept that we are unconditionally loved by God and that's most clearly expressed through Jesus. Accept that we are unconditionally loved by God. I love these words from Hebrews 12 too. The author writes, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Accept that we are unconditionally loved by God. Think about the cross for a moment. The cross was not joyful. So, so where is the joy that the writer of Hebrews is talking about? The joy is you. The joy is you. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. He endured the cross for you. His joy. The hard joy part of being loved is that we don't always get what we want. But let's face it, we don't always know what we want or what we need. And God knows. He gives us things and allows things for our growth and for his glory even though they might not be joyful at the time and the extent to which we trust Jesus in hard times is the extent of the amount of joy we will have 
and we will show. Because his love gives us identity, it gives us belonging, and it gives us purpose. Can I say that one more time? That's really, really important. God gives us things and allows things for our growth and for his glory, even though they might not be joyful at the time. The extent we trust Jesus in hard times is the extent of the amount of joy that we will have and we will show. Because his love gives us identity, belonging, and purpose. You know, God didn't give you all that you have so that you could have all that you want. God gave you all that you have so others could have all that they need. Except that we are unconditionally loved by God. Here's a second way that we can turn our oi to joy. It's this. Practice humble obedience. Practice humble obedience. Let's unpack those two words, humble and obedience. First, let's talk about being humble. To be humble is not to think less of yourself. Oh, I'm a worm. I'm no good. That's that's not humility. That's, that's stinking thinking. To be humble is not to think less of yourself, but rather to think of yourself less. To put others and their needs first before us. Here's how Paul said it in Philippians 2, beginning at verse 1. He writes, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, watch this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. To be humble is not to think less of yourself, it's to think of yourself less. One of the ways that we can do that is by stopping our comparison. Two things happen whenever we compare our situation, our circumstances to others. One of two things will happen. Either it will lead us to pride, like, hey, I'm doing not bad compared to that guy. Or it'll lead us to discouragement. So don't focus in on others. Practice humility by putting others first. Don't focus in on others and their situation in life, but focus in on how you can love and serve them. You know, as I was growing up in our kitchen, I think my sister made this uh, sign but it was about joy. And joy stood for Jesus, others, and you. That's the acronym of joy. Jesus, others, and you. And that has remained in my mind all through my life. Practice humble obedience. Let's talk about that obedience part. Obedience is simply doing what God told us to do. It's not just about knowing it. It's not about feeling it. It's about doing what God told us to do. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 23. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You know that joy is a command of the same importance as do not murder. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again. Rejoice. It's a command. If we're going to be obedient, then we've got to be joyful even when it's hard joy. So what's your next step of humble obedience? Maybe who can you be a blessing to? Who can you love? What can you give? How can you serve? Where do you need to reconcile? Where do you need to stop a sin? Uh, what's the next step, the next right thing that you need to do as a part of practicing humble obedience. Turning oi to joy, accept that we are unconditionally loved by God. Secondly, practice humble obedience. Thirdly, manage expectations. 
manage expectations is a great way that we can begin to experience joy. You know, for some, this earth is as close to heaven as they will ever get. That's a sad story. But for the follower of Jesus, for the one who has trusted Jesus as their forgiver and leader, then this earth is as close to hell as they will ever get. The reality is, we live in a broken, fallen world. And it is not perfect. It is not heaven. And there is sin. And there is darkness. And there is pain. But in God's justice and love, there is also a day coming. Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4 says it this way, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You know, we can, we can have joy knowing that God is just and God is love and heaven is waiting for followers of Jesus. You know, the, the worst things are never the last things. So just manage expectations. Don't, per, don't expect perfection here on earth. Don't expect there to be heaven here on earth. Why not? Because it's not. We live in a broken, sinful, painful world. But there's a day coming. That's a good place for an amen. Manage expectations. Fourthly and finally, enjoy. See that word joy? Enjoy God's presence and his presence. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Number one, enjoy his presence. Enjoy his gifts. Perhaps this morning you have the gift of health and life and strength. You're, you're alive. Maybe you saw the sunrise this morning. Maybe you've got a job that, that you go to work in. You know, part, of, part of being joyful is being thankful. How's your thankfulness factor this morning? What if, what if what we had tomorrow was based on what we were thankful for today? Have you given God thanks for your health? Have you given God thanks for your job as imperfect as it is? Enjoy God's presence. Celebrate his grace to you. Know this, that the blessings will change, but the blesser never does. The gifts will change in what they look like and how many come in. Sometimes it's easy joy. Sometimes it's hard joy. The blessings change, but the blesser never does. Enjoy what God has given to you. Enjoy his presence. Not only that, more importantly, enjoy his presence. Enjoy God's presence. Keep a 24-7 connection with God. We do that through our times of prayer. You know, it's important to have, a, I think, a designated time and place where each day we can we can, without distraction, focus in and talk with God and hear from Him. That's an important part of my day. I hope it's an important part of your day. But there's more than that. We need to be connected 24-7, to be in constant prayer with God, to be in, in constant awareness of His presence, of His work, of His power in our lives. Enjoy God's presence. Here's how Jesus said it in John 15 verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, Remain, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me 
and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Did you catch what Jesus was saying here about this being connected, this enjoying God's presence? That if we're connected, it just as a branch is connected to the vine, if we're connected, fruit is inevitable. It's going to happen as long as we're connected. That 24-7, that ongoing connection. As long as we're connected, fruit is inevitable. But as soon as we sever that connection, as soon as we say, God, thanks but no thanks, you know, I'm not joyful right now and, and I'm just going to stop. I'm going to walk away from you. As soon as we disconnect, fruit is impossible. As long as we mean, remain connected, fruit is inevitable. It's going to happen. But when we disconnect, fruit is impossible. I like the verse that we studied last week from Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Enjoy God's presence. Know that he is with you 24-7. You know, this Christmas, we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. God with us when we're sleeping, when we're awake. God with us when we're at work or at home. God is with us on our best days and on our worst days. Enjoy God's presence and God's presence. Have you done that? Have you ever trusted Jesus as your forgiver and leader? If you haven't, there's no better time or place than right here and right now to begin that eternity-changing relationship with God. It begins by admitting, admitting that we're sinners, that we've rebelled against God by our, by our words, by our actions, by our thoughts. It begins by admitting that we can't save ourselves. There's no amount of goodness that will ever outdo, <coughs> excuse me, or outperform the, there's no amount of goodness that will ever erase all of our badness. It's not about performance. We need to admit that we're sinners. Secondly, we need to believe. We need to believe that Jesus is God and that he died on the cross for us. He paid the price for our sins and he rose again to show that payment was made in full admit believe thirdly commit commit your life to following jesus all the days of your life that's that 24 7 kind of connection that whatever god tells you to do you do it admit believe commit let me pray and if you've never invited jesus to be your forgiver and leader this is the perfect time to do it perhaps Pray a prayer something like this. Dear Jesus, this morning I admit that I'm a sinner, that I have sinned against you, and that my sins have consequences. But Jesus, I, I believe. I believe that you are God and that you came to earth and that you died on the cross for my sins in my place. You saw me when I was still a sinner and you loved me and died for me. And so, Jesus, I receive you now as my forgiver and as my leader. I want to be with you. I want to do whatever you want me to do. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you've prayed that prayer, would you let me know? I've got some resources that would help you grow in your relationship with God. It's, it's part of the of the committing to God and growing in your relationship with him. Hey, just a, just a few thoughts as we end our morning before our final song. Tonight, uh, we have a, an online showing of Surviving the Holidays. Last night, we had our Blue Christmas Gathering, and this evening, we're, we're showing, it's about a 45-minute video called Surviving the Holidays. If you're in a season of grief, right now. Our, our love and our prayers are with you. And here's an opportunity that we have to, um, to hear from, from some that have gone through that same valley of the shadow that we have and, 
and learn how we can survive the holidays that are coming. Join us, follow, just use the Zoom link or contact me at the church office and I'll pass on that link to you. Christmas Eve is coming up in just a few days and we have a Christmas Eve kit to enhance your worship time this Christmas Eve. If you're in our church directory, um, you're going to get one automatically. But if you're not sure if you're in our directory, we still want to get this Christmas Eve kit into your hands. All you need to do is contact me at the church office. It's filled with all kinds of goodness that will enhance our worship time together this Christmas Eve. Next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating communion together. So I just want to give you a heads up on that. Hope you can join us uh, right after our last song for a great time of fellowship, of connecting with each other. We call it our lobby time. I uh, hope you can join us for that. Let me just pray a blessing over you as we begin to conclude our service this morning. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, help us to turn our oi into joy from knowing that you are in charge, from knowing that we can trust you because you are good and because you love us. Lord, we ask for your blessing over us this week so we can be a blessing to everyone we see and meet. Jesus, we love you and we need you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you on Zoom. If not, hope to see you on Christmas Eve. God bless you until then. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you. 